the spectra. And this example particularly hopes, hopefully would drive home the point. If my model was terrible, if this orange line was off of the blue data uh, substantially, for example, if I kept the exact same instrumental profile and then the blue data just went far from the, from the model, just for an example, um, this would be the instrumental profile that we use when we're, uh, when we're fitting the, uh, when we're fitting our models to the actual Doppler shift that we see from the stars that have exoplanets orbiting them. So if you're using this terrible model, or let's just say outdated model, let's just say that maybe the spectrograph isn't stable over nine months. If you're using an outdated instrumental profile, then you're misinterpreting that, that right side, that redder side of the broadening. And so if you're misinterpreting one side of the spectral line, you're gonna probably misinterpret the Doppler shifts that you see in your actual science. And you might accidentally introduce a Doppler shift into your uh, scientific analysis incorrectly. Um. <clears throat> so that's one conclusion. The Minerva spectrograph is stable for at least nine months. If you want to know more, we can talk about that later. But for the sake of time, I'm just moving on. <clears throat> so after the light goes through the telescope, through the fiber acquisition unit, through the fiber, through the spectrograph, now we're actually analyzing the data and converting uh, the Doppler shift measurement from the science, from the light, into radial velocities. And this is what I worked on as well, uh, finishing up the commissioning, and a part of finishing that up is finishing up the radial velocity pipeline. So what you're seeing here is a, a Minerva data for, for an RV standard star, HD 122064. By RV standard, I basically mean that it's not variable in any way. It's not a variable star. It doesn't have an exoplanet affecting its radial velocity motion. Um, it's not a magnetically active star that could potentially affect the radial velocity as well. So if it's an RV standard star, which it is, um, the data from our spectrograph should be constant. It shouldn't have any sinusoidal curves like we saw you know, in my cartoon example of what would happen if you have an exoplanet. And, you know, this is kind of, this is kind of flat, it's kind of flat, it's pretty decent, it's a little scatter, but at least, uh, at least it's not like a sinusoidal signal. But to really drive home the point, I create this Allen variance plot where um, you have the raw data uh, precision determined here from the raw data that is taken over the course of a month. So remember, the Minerva spectrograph is stable over the course of nine months. <clears throat> And then as you bend the data further down, you reach a point where you're no longer, where you're sort of introducing, um, sort of introducing correlated noise. So this white line is basically a model for the Allen variance plot, essentially saying that along this line, as long as your data, well, as long as your bending is parallel to this, then you're still corresponding to just random white noise. But once it deviates, once it's no longer parallel to this, you're introducing, um, correlated noise into your data, which is, yeah, they, you don't want to, anything to correlate uh, just based on systematics. So this is where we stop uh, to determine our, uh, our systematic noise floor. At this bending, at this precision, we get a precision of 1.8 meters per second for our radial velocities uh, with the Minerva spectrograph. Now that's the precision, and now to actually determine the accuracy, whether or not we can accurately detect an exoplanet or not. Uh, with Minerva, we're observing the 51 Peg B, obviously a famous star, famous exoplanet as well, a high Jupiter exoplanet. Um, and this is showing the radial velocity curves for the Minerva, uh, for the Minerva telescope. Uh, and here is the phase folded curve. The red line represents the model that's uh, derived primarily from the uh, ExoFast IDL software. <clears throat> so just one thing to clear up, the model looks pretty great to the data, for one. Um, and I'm just re bringing home the point that uh, this is the sinusoidal curve that I mentioned in the very beginning for, for those who aren't as familiar with the radial velocity technique of exoplanets. 
So with that model constrained by the data, we get uh, these parameters. I'm only showing ExoFast Exo spits out a ton of parameters, but um, I'm only showing basically the most important radial velocity parameters for the exoplanet. So with the radial velocity, you can get the period, eccentricity, RV simile amplitude, and the lower limit of the uh, exoplanet mass. And you don't need to focus on these numbers. Just know that these numbers are similar or within one sigma of the, uh, of the literature that we, that we already know of. 51 Peg B is a well-known exoplanet, well-studied. So we were just comparing our, uh, our results to what's already known in the literature. And seeing that it's the same, we've, our spectrograph can produce precise and accurate uh, radio velocity measurements. So I feel like throughout the, this talk, I'm going to have to give introduction, conclusion, introduction, conclusion, introduction, conclusion. So I'm going to keep doing that. Uh, so as a conclusion of this work, um, the uh, radio velocity mode of Minerva operates at a high cadence and stability, proven. RV pipeline is complete. Uh, Minerva's first precise and accurate characterization of an exoplanet, done. And thus, its commissioning phase is completed as well. You can read more about it in my paper. Um, and updates with respect to that. Uh, Minerva is conducting um, follow-up observations for the test mission. Um, and it's also prioritizing Doppler tomography to understand the planets, the alignment between the planet's orbit and the star's uh, spin axis, which helps you sort of constrain planetary formation models. Um, if you're interested in that, we can talk about it more later, though. Let's move on to solar CMEs. I've already told you all about several spectroscopic techniques already, so we're going to learn more as we go on. But I also, I'm going to sort of drive home the point eventually about how these are scientifically um, connected rather than just technically connected. Um, so with my solar CME work, I've focused on the energy budget and the heating of solar CMEs. And the way to sort of simply understand the purpose of what I'm doing is if we acquire better measurements of the CME energy budget, that in turn will allow us to obtain better physical models that actually describe a the mechanisms that drive a coronal mass ejection in the first place. What we do understand is that um, after the initial eruption, free magnetic energy is converted into other forms of energy, kinetic energy, gravitational potential energy, thermal energy, so on and so forth. We also understand in general that heating is a significant portion of the CME's energy budget, even though we do not actually uh, fully understand the physical mechanisms that cause that heating in the first place. Even though we don't fully understand the physics, we have, a, there's obviously evidence of this in observations of this heating. For example, eruption of cool prominence, uh, prominence material evolves due to this extended heating even after the coronal mass ejection erupts. So this is seen in the sense of um, the cool uh, prominence material of the CME is seen as absorption features. And then later, as the CME travels, it's seen again as an emission feature, which is a sign that it's getting hotter and hotter. Another sort of point of evidence that this heating truly is happening is the fact that highly ionized plasma is observed at high altitudes in the corona. And the idea is that in order for it to reach such a high ionization state, it must have been continuously being heated even after the initial eruption. Lastly, um, there have been several papers, like seven or ten papers, that have actually quantitatively calculated the cumulative heating energy for these for CMEs. And basically all that is is just the um, total thermal energy that's continuously being generated within the CME as it's traveling. <clears throat> and that total thermal energy being generated is often comparable to the CME's kinetic energy and its gravitational potential energy. So just considering cons conservation laws, just considering the energy budget, energy terms, if we, we obviously understand how important potential energy is, how important kinetic energy is for the CME, um, the mass, the speed, 
these parameters. So if the heating energy is similar to the kinetic energy, then that means that this heating process that we don't fully understand is very important. It affects, it affects the rest of the energy budget um, and thus affects the uh, evolution of the CME itself. Go. Okay. I decided to uh, learn more about this CME heating problem uh, by studying a unique data set that comes from a CME that erupted back in 1999. And I'll explain later why this is such a unique archival data set that I decided to study. What you're seeing here is the CME, um, the front edge here, and then the prominence core, which is very diffuse all of there. And the blue lines represent the UVCS slit. So UVCS is a uh, solar space-based instrument, the ultraviolet coronagraph spectrometer. It's a single slit spectrometer. So that's why I'm representing that slit with these blue lines. Um, with UVCS and, and this particular data set, as you can see, these blue lines only captured the prominence core. There were no blue lines. I didn't draw any blue lines here. So only the bright CME core is captured. With the UVCS, we have a spectral coverage in between 950 angstroms to 1350 angstroms. And one thing that I'll mention is that with UVCS, its, ob its observing program is, um, is written such that the slit is programmed to observe at different altitudes. So you're seeing the slit as it's sort of shifting up and up in the corona. Here's all of the information, uh, well, uh, summarized, um, that we can get from the UVCS spectra. So I'll just go through it one by one. We can constrain the plane of sky velocity. So I made this sort of, I made this diagram just to demonstrate that. Um, if you imagine this line as the sun, and then like you saw those blue lines, uh, these white lines represent the slit at different times, just observing at different heights. And if you imagine that these dots represent small sort of structures within the CME that crosses the uh, field of view of the slit, then you'll see that we see certain structures here, certain structures there, certain structures here, certain structures there. And just by looking at the, observing it at this height, observing it at that height, a different time, you get to average the, get the average velocity between those two heights which is along the plane of sky. This is spectra, this is a spectrometer. Uh, so obviously we also get Doppler shift information so we can constrain the line of sight velocity of the CME as well. Uh, this is a segment of the UVCS detector. So the x-axis is wavelength, there's that Doppler shift information. Um, and the y-axis is just the position along the slit. Once again, you're seeing segments of the UVCS detector, three segments. Um, and I'm just showing this just to emphasize that we have a variety of spectral lines, and that in turn gives us a variety of ions to observe, which allows us to better understand the ionization states of this CME. Uh, so for example, we have the oxygen-6 doublet, 1032 angstroms, 1038 angstroms, neutral hydrogen, lime and alpha at 1216 angstroms, so on and so forth. Again, the detector, but now uh, I'm giving you a specific example of some of the data that, we've, uh, that we see with this CME in particular. And it's actually the reason why this is a unique data set. So what you're seeing here, so this is 1022 plus 10, 1032, the oxygen six doublets, 1032, 1038. Um, you're seeing the CME here, and then the rest is just the background corona well, you're seeing sort of structures within the CME. And in particular, it sort of looks like an elongated structure here and then a, like, a, like a bright bulge structure here. Um, and this is the data captured when the slit was at a height of 2.6 solar radii in the corona. Then the slit shifts to a higher height, 3.1 solar radii. And we see, again, a structure where it's kind of elongated and then there's like a bright bulge here. 
this is actually one of the one of the pieces of evidence to indicate that we we observe the exact same individual structure within the CME. And that's actually incredibly difficult to do with a coronagraph spectrometer. Um, you see the CME material all the time as the slit moves at higher and higher heights, but to get the exact same sh plasma structure from one height to another is just pure luck. The reason why that's pure luck is because with CMEs, you can't predict when a CME is gonna happen. So the UVCS uh, like observing program just so happened to be looking at the right part of the corona. You also can't predict uh, where a CME will happen. You can't predict how fast the CME will move. So uh, the automated programming for the slit is just to move from this height to this height. Doesn't know if a CME is gonna happen or not. It just so happened to shift while the CME was still uh, slow enough to, it crossed the slit first, shifted, and then the CME crossed the slit again. This is pure luck. Uh, uh, chrono first of all, there aren't many chronograph spectrometers in general. Um, and currently, actually, none in space opera are operational as far as I'm concerned, as far as I know. So this is not only a unique data set, but we're, um, we're really missing out on potentially more of these lucky observations. Um, oh, why did it shift? Oh, go, go. There we go. Um, what makes this so great for me personally is that since we have the exact same plasma structure, we can monitor it as a function of height. We can monitor the density at one height, well, get the density at one height, get the density again at another height, get the temperature, temperature, see if how that temperature evolves, see if it's being heated, see if it's, being, uh, if it's expanding. And you can only do that if you have the exact same plasma structures. So just to drive home the point, I'm showing this light curve. What you're seeing is um, x-axis is just observation time and y-axis is the intensity. So when the slit was monitoring the corona at 2.6 solar radii, it took an image at this time, this time, this time, this time, this time. And then the slit shifted to a higher height, took an image at this time, so on and so forth. As you can see, there's a pattern. It's like it increases, peaks, drops. Increases, peaks, drops. That same pattern being seen from one height to another is like unprecedented for a chronograph spectrometer, which is just another form of proof that I used in a paper to prove that this is a unique observation, that we truly did get lucky and capture uh, the same structures from one height to another. So structure A, structure A. Structure B is the brightest, structure B is seen again, and then structure C is seen again. And this is specifically a light curve for the oxygen six 1032 line. Now I'm showing uh, um, the importance of intensity ratios. So now this is another very important spectroscopic technique that I hope uh, may or may not be new for some of you all. Um, plasma diagnosis can be deduced from these intensity ratios. And this is particularly because we're making use of the collisional excitation of the radiation that we see versus the radiative excitation. And I'll explain that in a second. But basically what you're looking at here is almost like a light curve. You're seeing the 1032 intensity divided by the intensity ratio between the two. And this is the intensity ratio when the slit was located at this height, this height, this height, this height. And then at this height, 2.6 solar radii. At this height, 3.1 solar radii. So what's happening here, well, the importance of this is the fact that with this CME, this coronal plasma, uh, free electrons are colliding with the ions that we see, ions like oxygen-6. And that's causing the ions to get excited, de-excited, get the photon. And that's what uh, UVCS is seeing. Um, but that's just the collisional excitation component. There is a radiative excitation component as well where you see, in particular, for this intensity ratio, it's noticeable. 
the radiation from the surface of the sun goes out, hits the CME that's already traveling, and then the, C the ions within the CME get excited, de-excited, scatters towards UVCS. So that's the difference between a collisional, uh, free electrons colliding within the CME, radiative excitation, radiation from the surface, or specifically the chromosphere, uh, scattering off of it. So with this intensity ratio, we can deduce some plasma diagnostics, uh, particularly some parameters that involve the velocity, density, uh, and you notice that depending on how high or how low the intensity ratio is. And this, in, this intensity ratio in particular hovers around two point, well, two, a factor of two. This is because the, um, just the atomic physics of the oxygen six, uh, oxygen six atom, uh, the oscillator strengths between the two, uh, between the two um, transitions, between the 1032 transition, 1038 transition, you get twice as many photons in the 1032 wavelength than in the 1038 wavelength. So you're noticing with our intensity ratio, even, even though the atomic models show us that that's supposed to be the case, of course we see it in the data as well, but when the data deviates from 2.0, then we can get some astrophysical information rather than uh, depending on just the atomic physics. So when it's higher, substantially higher than 2.0, you can constrain the velocity. It means that the CME or whatever plasma you're observing is moving very slowly. And that's due to the fact that the radiative scattering, the radiative excitation, is very dominant. It's a dominant component in the uh, 1038 and 1032 line. Uh, as you can see here, the data, uh, it sort of goes back down to 2.0. So that's just atomic physics. We don't get any astrophysical information, so the parameters are more ambiguous now. And that's because the collisional component is dominating. Then, at higher heights, all we get is uh, intensity ratios below two. And this is a nice sweet spot because this means that we can constrain both the velocity and the density. And it doesn't, the velocity doesn't have to be very slow in this case. It can be very fast. It can be 1,000 kilometers per second. Um, uh, and this is because the collisional and radiative uh, components are sort of balancing each other out. And this is due to uh, a process called radiative pumping. And for the sake of time, I won't go into the details of that, but <laughs> uh, if you want to know more, we can talk about it later, the details of what radiative pumping is doing. <clears throat> so you've already seen this sort of diagram. You've already seen this diagram. Um, these are two different ways, two independent ways to determine the velocity of the plasma that you're observing. I've already shown you that, you know, with the Doppler shift, you get the line of sight velocity. With the height, oh, where's my mouse? With the height to height comparison, you get the plane of sky uh, velocity component. But over here, we used uh, our understanding of atomic physics to determine what the, um, if the velocity is very slow, what the density is, so on and so forth. And what I found was that there's a discrepancy between these two techniques um, at the lower heights, at heights of like 1.5. The velocity that we get here is in agreement with the velocity that we get here for the two different techniques. So that's great. What we, uh, found or the most, the reason why there's a discrepancy between these two techniques at the bottom, at the lower heights, is primarily because we made an incorrect assumption when we were looking at the, uh, the data here. We assume that the blobs you see here are the same as the blobs you see here. This is why it's so important to actually observe the exact same plasma structures from one height to another. Because these are actually a different part of the CME than the ones at the higher height. And so that's why our velocity estimate here is actually um, different than what the atomic physics models are telling us it should be. This is saying it should be about 50 kilometers per second, and my assumptions here said it should be about 100 kilometers per second. So that was like a factor of two discrepancy, and uh, 
it was pretty obvious that it was because I made an incorrect assumption there. But things are great up here. And I already showed you, you know, from one height to another, the light curve, the pattern is the same. So we are observing the exact same structures. What a coincidence. The two independent techniques are in agreement when we have all of that evidence to prove that it's truly the same structure. <clears throat> so that's why, that's one of the reasons why intensity ratios are so important. I specifically showed you an example for the oxygen six intensity ratio. But there are other intensity ratios that we use for this to analyze the CME. You can better understand the density, velocity, temperature, ionization states. Uh, and if you want to know, you know more of the details about why these particular intensity ratios are so great, you can ask about, talk to me later about that. But I'll just move on for the sake of time. Um, so that's how we uh, are using are determining the physical properties of the CME, the temperature, density, so on and so forth. And now I'm trying to model and monitor the energy budget and the rate of heating that's occurring within the CME. So the goal here is to understand the post-eruption CME energy budget. We understand that after the eruption, there's a fraction of magnetic energy that gets converted into other forms of energy. The thermal energy in particular involves uh, some cooling mechanisms radiative cooling, uh, cooling due to just the expansion of the plasma. And then the heating mechanisms, there are some guesses and models to sort of describe it, but nothing has been perfect yet uh, in describing the, the reason why um, this CME heating problem is uh, quite confusing. So I am monitoring the ener internal energy of the CME system, particularly the energy uh, is changing due to the heating, the cooling, and obviously because of these heating and cooling terms, there's changes in temperature. The density is changing as well in my models. And I'm also uh, using non-equilibrium ionization states, which is a fancy word for saying that I'm not assuming ionization equilibrium. Again, that's another detail. You can you know, talk to me more about that later. <laughs> if you're interested. So let's just hop right into the results, or well, some of the results. I have plenty of plots like this, plenty of results. So this is just one example. So like I said, I'm modeling uh, uh, sort of the rate of heating, the rate of cooling that this plasma is undergoing, and the ionization states as well. So what you're about to see is a temperature profile of, the, uh, of my models being constrained by the data seen with UVCS. So you could, in this example, the temperature dropped, increased. Over here, the ionization fractions are being determined for two ions in particular. But let's just focus over here for a quick second. So remember I said that the, we found the observed, luckily observed the exact same structures at a height of 2.6 and 3.1 solar radii. That's where our constraints are. So I'm trying to constrain this entire evolution of the plasma of the CME. Um, and our constraints are sort of anchored here. So that's why you see upper and lower limits in temperature here, upper and lower limits in temperature here. And this is dependent on certain assumptions that I make, assumptions about the density. This is just a power law representing the density is expanding slowly or the density is expanding pretty fast. Um, and these constraints are specifically uh, done with uh, the intensity ratio, well, one of the intensity ratios that we used, and observes for structure A, structure B, structure C, those structures that we saw in the light curves earlier. And just to sort of wrap your head around these two plots together, um, so this intensity ratio uses neutral hydrogen as well as oxygen six. So in my models, I'm modeling the ionization states of neutral hydrogen and oxygen six. Neutral hydrogen is squares, oxygen six is the diamonds. So neutral hydrogen is increasing sort of consistently. The temperature was decreasing consistently. That makes sense. The temperature is too hot for there to be a lot of uh, neutral hydrogen. So the neutral hydrogen um, increased as the temperature got cooler and cooler and cooler. 
so that's just sort of to wrap your head around these models and what I'm doing with them. So because I am, I have these models constrained by the intensity, the intensity ratio data, and you, I'm getting the temperature profile, the density, the ionization states, that in turn allows me to determine the total thermal energy being generated throughout that profile. So that's why I was able to calculate the cumulative heating energy and I already know the velocity based on those two independent velocity techniques. Um, and so uh, what I, one conclusion I found is that the cumulative heating energy is about the same as the kinetic energy, which is the same as a few other papers have gotten uh, for their CME studies. And this is regardless of the heating parameterization that I use. Um, with the rate of heating, I have to sort of define that as a simple sort of... Um, just parameterization defining what parameters might be most important for this unknown heating mechanism. Is density the most important parameter or is the square of the density the most important? So the rate of heating is proportional to how the square density changes, so on and so forth. I have uh, different parameterizations to represent different rates of heating uh, that balances out with the cooling. <clears throat> These two in particular, this is, a wave, this is from a wave heating model. It's just the heating decreases exponentially. This is uh, sort of inspired by a magnetic heating model um, where the magnetic flux rope uh, is expanding, maybe three-dimensionally, maybe two-dimensionally. And because of the magnetic flux rope is expanding, the magnetic pressure is changing as the CME is expanding and, so, and traveling. And that would... Uh, in theory, uh, maybe change the rate of heating. <clears throat> so now I'm just gonna, you know, th those are the most important conclusions of that study. And you all learned some spectroscopic techniques, intensity ratios, so on and so forth. So let's just recap. Magnetic energy is converted into other forms of energy. Cumulative heating energy is similar to the kinetic energy. And in particular, my uh, rate of heating that's proportional to the magnetic, uh, magnetic flux rope expansion is actually, amongst the assumptions that I make, it's the most realistic assumption that I have. Um, and we can talk more about that later, about uh, how I was able to prove that. One of the most important things about this study was the fact that the data set itself was unique. Um, and that, in turn, allowed me to get unique constraints on the heating that's going on in these CMEs. So for the future, um, I would like to see multi-slit chronograph spectrometers. Because the whole reason why this was unique and lucky is because it was a single slit spectrometer shifting, luckily, at the perfect time, perfect position, angle, everything. So if we have two slits just staying there monitoring the corona, then the... CME would just cross. We don't need to get lucky and shift things around. Uh, and Lockyer hopefully will be one of those multi-slit uh, chronograph spectrometers. It's uh, going to be proposed as a NASA MIDEX mission. Lastly, for my thesis, uh, I worked on extrapolating the knowledge that I've gained from these solar CMEs onto trying to detect stellar CMEs. Yep. There we go. Stellar CMEs are very difficult to detect, more specifically difficult to confirm that you have a detection. Um, so the search for CMEs usually includes a variety of techniques, uh, Doppler shift information um, from the star that you're looking at, spectral line asymmetry, um, coronal dimmings of the star, X-ray absorption seen while observing the star as well. Um, and here I'm showing um, a plot by uh, Sophia uh, Moscow um, where she sort of gave a comprehensive review of all of the, well, not all, but most of the um, stellar CME candidates that are, have been proposed as a detection. Um, and so what you're seeing here, y-axis mass, x-axis is the flare, x-ray energy. So she's comparing the CME's energy to the flare's energy and sort of seeing if the extrapolations from solar data uh, extrapolates well with the stellar CME data. So my uh, approach was just to 
or my purpose in looking at this was just to predict if diagnostic UV spectral lines from stellar CMEs are observable, specific ones that I really, um, that I really like as a, as a diagnostic. So what you're seeing here, um, I looked at the CME that was studied by uh, Enrico Landi, and he gathered the emission measure for the CME that he was, well, they, the collaboration was studying. <clears throat> Extrapolating that emission measure, he used plasma diagnostics and everything like that, same as similar to what I was doing. Extrapolating that information, getting a luminosity of, this, of the CME, and then converting that to a flux as if that flux is coming from a distant star. And I calculated that flux um, for specific spectral lines. Um, and we can talk more later why I chose these specific lines. But basically, I was calculating the signal to noise ratio that you might get, that you might suspect if you have a stellar CME that, is, that has similar properties as a solar CME. And the carbon-4 line is actually the, gives us the best uh, signal-to-noise ratio amongst these uh, spectral lines. Um, so long story short, with UV detections or of stellar CME candidates, it can be quite difficult. So I'm trying to propose that, hey, there are some UV spectral lines that we should specifically aim for, especially if another instrument comes out and um, performs a dedicated survey to search for stellar CMEs. I changed the calculations um, extrapolating them out to a different star. At first I was doing 10 parsecs just to be as generic as possible. And then I was a little bit more specific in saying, what about Proxima Centauri, our closest star other than our sun? Um, and I was like, uh, let's see, it only needs a exposure time of a minute uh, with, um, with these parameters. And actually, it's sort of the same flux. Um, if I have an integration time over an hour, you get these um, signal-to-noise ratios predicted for a star that's 10 parsecs away. And then for Proxima Centauri, you get the same, same results if you just have an exposure time of one minute. I did the same, similar, similar uh, predictions from my own CME. So the plasma diagnostics, the physical properties of my CME, I'm extrapolating that out to a distant star. So I'm just showing you this plot once again, just to prove a point. Um, now I'm changing up the calculation a little bit. Uh, remember I was talking about exposure times and integration times. So now based on the properties, and remember these models are constrained with the data, so they're believable. Um, this, in my simulation here, it took my simulated CME an hour to travel to the heights that UVCS observed it. So if I integrate for an hour, then I'll see uh, the, um, the properties that the CME exhibited here through here are all accounted for within that hour, all of the flux or, or photons that we get. So high density, that gives you uh, more collisional excitation, more radiation in the UV for the CME. So just to keep that concept in mind. So now I'm looking at two specific lines, oxygen six, carbon three, and they give me very low signal to noise. So that, you know, it's kind of unfortunate, assuming that the star is 10 parsecs away and you know, my integration time, this is a specific integration time. Um, and then for Proxima Centauri, assuming um, it gets a better, uh, obviously a better signal to noise ratio. Same exact parameters, but the star is closer, therefore the flux is greater, therefore the signal to noise is better. So that's what I've been up to, uh, making these predictions and proposing that we use certain spectral lines because I like these spectral lines. They are uh, very helpful for intensity ratios, actually. Um, you already know this one, 1032 oxygen 6. So I'll just summarize here. CME candidates have been found, but the properties of the CMEs are mm, not very known. Um, I propose that more UV, specifically UV, uh, diagnostic spectral lines be used. These in particular are pretty nice, pretty uh, useful, and 
based on my predictions, can be observed, especially if it's the M dwarf uh, Proxima Centauri. And for future reference, I, well, I would like to see a dedicated UV spectrograph uh, do exactly this. And it doesn't have to search for stellar CMEs. It could be just, if I'm talking integration times of an hour or one minute or something like that, that's along the time scales of an exoplanet transit. So if you're observing a star, you're using radio velocities, the spectra, then give me some of that spectra so I can see if it's that man magnetic activity for your exoplanet is, you know, is affecting your exoplanet. And UV scope is actually a NASA MEDEX mission that's currently being proposed. It's a dedicated UV spectrograph dedicated to, uh, and by dedicated I mean it's actually um, going to stare at certain stars for days, probably like 30 days. Um, so with, you know, over the course of 30 days, maybe I'll see some magnetic activity. Um, and, uh, and in particular, it's focused on uh, exoplanet transits and um, getting the, uh, characterizing the exoplanet atmospheres. So I'll leave you all with that. Hopefully you all learned some spectroscopic techniques and see how all of these scientific topics are sort of related Solar, obviously related to stellar CMEs. Stellar CMEs, obviously related to exoplanet habitability and atmospheres. So I hope you enjoyed my talk. Well, it's not real data. It's just predicted. Um, it's predicted from real data. It's well, extrapolated from it. No, go back to the slides. Yeah. Okay. Like you can approach a trajectory slide on stellar CMEs. So Sophia. Oh, Sophia. Oh, okay. Yeah, so you might know the answer back. Mm -hmm. are, are those symbols, are those dates, like 660 BC? Yes, actually, yes. So she. <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> so this is a part of the, um, a lot of these claims of uh, detections are, um, uh, the, a lot of assumptions are involved, let me put it that way. A lot of, and even the error bars you see are heavily based on assumptions. Um, so yeah, I think that's the simplest answer to your question. I, I, um, I made that plot and it's, um, yeah, you, can, you, you apply scalings essentially. Um, yeah. Of what? <laughs> 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 so, so, what, you what if there's a, something broke down that there's a right thing on the left? No, it's just done from, uh, yeah, from things like, like tree ring data and things like that. Oh. <laughs> and so you, you, you infer the, the particle fluxes, and so from that you infer from scaling relations particle fluxes to x ray fluxes. So, yeah, large error bars. When you look at the scale, <laughs> 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 so, so do this. Mm -hmm. Middle part, the solar CM. Mm -hmm. So, one of your results was that this heating energy mm -hmm. is, is comparable to the kinetic energy, right? Yep. Is there a simple reason? I mean, it's a result, okay, but. What's the physics there? Yeah, so that's not fully understood yet. I, I, my paper is, will like be the tenth one that quantitatively characterized and got this same result. Um, now, it might have something to do with magnetic reconnection happening if a flare occurs with it. Uh, magnetic reconnection between the flare ribbons and the prominence of the CME. Uh, that magnetic reconnection may uh, produce certain heating and that might correlate directly with the explosion or the transfer of ki kinetic energy. Um, but it's not well understood at all. And unfortunately, well, the, the reason why it's important for me to add to the papers that have found a similar conclusion is because, for one, I propose that there, it might have something to do directly related to the magnetic field. Uh, magnetic flux rope, and uh, other papers haven't like proposed that kind of result. But there is one theoretical, not data analysis, but just pure theoretical, um, that this uh, 
sort of inspired by um, Kumar and Rust, um, their model tries to explain not, they don't conclude in their model that the cumulative heating energy equals kinetic energy, but they're one of the few models that actually took the heating problem seriously when they were uh, modeling uh, a CME. Um, usually the heating isn't uh, uh, a large sort of, it isn't taken very seriously in, in CME models, usually, usually. But nowadays, hopefully, you know, it is more so than usual. So the physics, I don't know. Model, models aren't even trying for the most part. So, yeah, just don't. Obviously, it's important because it's not just this one off, right? You're saying exactly, it's yeah. Repeatedly. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah, I think it's a good given time to become a teacher and provide the carbon four was by far the like go through line for detecting uh, stellar CMEs, like what's going on there? Um, so part of the uh, part of the reason the the emission measure. So there's some hidden information that you're not seeing here um, because I can't show you everything, you know. Um, but if you read Landy's Enrico Landy's paper, um, then you'll see that the emit the differential emission measure curve that he has. Uh, and let me just explain this. Emission measure is basically the amount of, uh, the amount of plasma that is causing the radiation that you see, particularly the collisional excitation that you see. So the emission measure is, um, if you have the electron density squared, then you can sort of estimate the emission measure. So um, the, um, if you were to look at his curve, you will see that, uh, Around this temperature, this cool temperature, 100,000, yeah, 100,000 Kelvin, um, anything lower than a million is cool. Uh, uh, that, at that temperature, that's when there was like a peak, sort of. Um, so that's why. This is an extrapolation from his CME's uh, behavior. That's why. No more questions. Uh, we're actually supposed to be uh, having the thesis defense fairly shortly. So thanks again, Maurice. Okay.